I mean, if it doesn't make any news. So um, let's turn to the audience now and sort of get them to sort of perhaps ask you some questions, either about the article or about some of the themes we're talking about, or even if you're open to this, some of your reporting during the Arab Spring, which is really stellar and outstanding. So the floor is open. Um, I see Rabon at the uh, microphone. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Go ahead. I've been standing in line because Sorry, I, I, I didn't know. I, didn't I have a question that I'm dying to ask. Please. I'm dying to ask. Please. <laughs> it, it's about, um, first of all, thank you very much, David, for uh, coming to our conference and for your presentation, wonderful presentation. Um, yes, I mean, these interference from foreign powers is not easy to get rid of or to stop. But if anything, we are a country of rule of law. And there is a law against supporting coups in other countries and supporting governments after coups in other countries. There is a law. And yet, you were in Egypt when the coup happened in 2013, and recently, a more recent coup happened in Tunisia. And the US, US really did not stop supporting these regimes after the coup. That's illegal. Why doesn't the legal system or our political system or together work to apply the rule of law, which is that we do not support a government after a military coup or after any coup against democracy? Why can't we at least hold on to that, you know, law and, you know, force the government, force everybody to respect the law? I mean, you were in Egypt, that's why I'm trying to understand. Yeah, also. well, right. In my, in, what my book, in my book, I wrote extensively about the decision within the Obama administration not to call the coup in Egypt a coup. Exactly. It was a coup. Um, uh, you know, if, um, you know, at a certain level, there are questions over my head. If you're asking why isn't the American government less cynical and more honest and transparent and ethical, that's definitely a plan. Um, in uh, point of fact, why did the, the Obama administration not call the coup a coup? Uh, it goes back to the things that we've been talking about. I mean, they, uh, they were persuaded that their partnership with Egypt, and in particular their military partnership in Egypt, uh, could be jeopardized if they called it a coup, uh, and that was the, 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 the paramount consideration. Um, their allies, as you mentioned, the re uh, in the region were also um, uh, were strongly supporting um, support for the coup. You know, it, the, the hacking of Ambassador Otaibu's emails revealed that he sent several pointed and threatening messages to his close friends in the National Security Council that day, uh, warning the U.S. that it didn't get a, if it didn't get on the bandwagon, it would face a kind of backlash in the region. That was his pitch. So, so that was going on as well. And, we, the earlier panelists, spoke in various ways about the, um, the fatalism or pathologizing of the uh, of Middle East, that these, these are, you know, uh, the Orientalism, the, the sense that these, it, it's always been like this, etc. That was also clearly at work. I think there was a, there was a certain fatalism or pessimism um, baked into many of the, uh, the thinking by many of the top policymakers, um, certainly uh, Secretary of State Kerry uh, and uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel, who were key interlocutors with uh, Egypt at the time and key players in policymaking in the White House, I think they both thought, look, as Kerry more or less put it to me, you know, Egypt has had these authoritarian military regimes for a long time. We've worked with them. Has it been perfect? No. Is it going to change? No. Um, which, again, it's a, that's a low expectation, and I think reflects some uh, of the biases we've been talking about, um, uh, and became a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, arguably. Um, but all those things were worked. So we had the military partnership, influence of allies, and this sort of soft um, Orientalism or Islamophobia, I think. Sarah Lee? Uh, 
And thank you, um, David. I wanted to ask you about your experience and observations from your time at the New York Times, but you know, within the broader uh, American media, and, and certainly from my perspective, the New York Times being among the best in the world uh, in terms of the coverage of, of what's happening in the world. Um, do you observe, or have you observed, as, as I tend to observe, and, and whether you think it's misplaced, particularly among national security correspondents, um, correspondents who cover Washington, cover politics in Washington, um, the reverse almost, or, or the flip side of the pathologizing of the Middle East and, and of Arabs and Muslims, um, a, a pedestaling of, uh, of America and the American government as fundamentally agents for good, uh, fundamentally well-intentioned, uh, democracy-promoting, agenda. And do you see that pervading their coverage and their description of decision making in Washington, uh, as well as accepting claims of the U.S. government as fact? So for years we've been subject to the Iranian-backed Houthis from the first days of the war in Yemen without ever even needing to proffer any evidence for that, but never once describing the Saudi uh, government as the U.S.-backed Saudi government, for example. You know, do you see that that orientation uh, um, uh, in the reporting, or am I reading too much into it? Um, your your question is quite sprawling. Uh, on the on the general belief that uh, the U.S. has an exceptional and noble role playing in the, in the world, I don't think that's embraced by the New York Times. I'd refer that question to Shadi in the back there. I can speak to there. The um, uh, in terms of whether the, the mainstream media, including the New York Times, is too credulous of the claims of the American government, I strongly don't think that's the case. I mean, the, just the day-to-day -day incentives in the lives of American journalists is that if you can uh, embarrass the American government, you get a gold star. If you can epically humiliate the American government, you win a Pulitzer Prize. All the incentives are towards skepticism, and that includes skepticism of uh, designations of the antagonists in the Yemen conflict. I, don't, I think you are factually mistaken if um, there was not skepticism in the New York Times applied to the Iranian uh, relationship with the Houthis or the Saudi relationship with um, its uh, uh, preferred um, government, or government in, in Yemen. Um, I mean, I was involved in some of that coverage and there was a lot of uh, skepticism, as there should be. Next question. Uh, thank you very much, David. And um, so in the discussion, and if I remember correctly in your article, it's been a little while since I read it, um, the framing was, was really one of foreign policy. And I'm saying it is so. Um, and, but you've made a nod a couple of times to this notion of Islamophobia uh, being a catalyst. I think it might be the other way around. I think it's really that's the core issue uh, and it's really a domestic policy story and with a foreign policy chaser. Um, you know, so the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding here in DC recently did some work on banking while Muslim here in the US. So I'll, I'll kind of use that as an example. Uh, Islamic Relief USA has had a lot of issues, you know, maintaining accounts and, and, and maintaining uh, financial relations, but even LaunchGood, which is own, which is, a, you know, the CEO of LaunchGood is a white convert, right? So it's just this notion of being kind of somewhat related uh, to Muslimy things that you know kind of gets you into trouble, um, and so if I can, if you'll just indulge me, I mean, I, I'll just give you an analogy. It seems that you know, uh, like Muslim organizations are trying to kind of grow down the river, and they kind of have um, you know like a, a, a hole. They have a leak, right? And and you know they're, they're they're trying to kind of get some water out of there. And it seems like these foreign you know entities are just looking at that and maybe just kind of throwing a couple more cups of water in there. The core issue is that you have this leak. The core issue is that you have this kind of domestic policy um, that needs to be addressed. Um, you know that seems to that's my perspective. I'd love to hear. Your yeah, I wouldn't call it a catalyst. I'm just I mean I I I just heard the panel this morning bring up again and again in various terms you know the Orientalism or um, uh, the pathologizing uh, of the region, and that squares with my opinion that that's going on, right? There is this weird um, thing that you encounter as an American journalist when you're talking about your reporting. People will, you know, I'll come back talking with people who I think of as sophisticated, educated liberals who 
would never uh, knowingly indulge in anything that might be labeled bigotry, and they would say, what happened to the Arab Spring? Was, it, was the problem Islam? And I, I just think, what? Do you know what I mean? That's just such a false dichotomy. Like one of these things is a religion, and the other is a form of government. And by the way, you would never, you would be humiliated to say that about any other religion. Like you substitute Buddhism or Hinduism or Judaism in that sentence, and you would be laughed out of the room. Um, and yet people say it with a straight face. So I don't, you know, I don't know what causes this, and I'm not sure it's a policy problem, and I would love to know the solution, but it's definitely a thing. Next question. Thank you for your journalism. I, I, you made a comment about the motive that authoritarian Middle Eastern countries have in undermining, to do this kind of activity, in undermining their perceived enemies in the West. The, isn't there also a role played by their attempt to undermine their perceived their actual or perceived rivals in their own lands. After all, it was a Muslim Brotherhood established party that won the election in Egypt. Um, I thought it went without saying that uh, an authoritarian government does not like its uh, domestic dissidents and is the enemy of free speech. I thought that's the, that's the table stakes for the conversation. Okay, we're, we're getting close to the end, so we have three people standing up. If I can just ask no one else to join the line so we can get to the questions and some answers. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> it's true, authoritarian regimes are trying to influence, and this example that you mentioned are amazing actually, for UAE and Qatar. But let me take this back here. In 1971, we had the Erzberg, uh, the paper, uh, the Pentagon Papers, uh, where we basically spitted the information about the Vietnam War in our own way. We had uh, WikiLeaks. We have just lately the Pegasus uh, files. Then we have the Twitter files, where we know that every agency here in this government is trying to influence and spin the information right and left. And then, I mean, it is the idea that the authoritarian regime are doing it is not only them. Are we doing the same thing? Let me give you the last example. Uh, in 2003, two members of APAC were caught red-handed basically getting classified information from here, the United States, to Israel to influence our policy in, uh, in Iran. And then what happened? The Department of Justice dropped all charges against these two people. And they were spying on us. So, is it the issue? Is it really UAE, Qatar, or it's really uh, the new colonial approach to meddling with other people? Thank you. Um, I, I find your question sort of going in a couple yeah, of ways. Yeah, I, 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 I was going to ask you for, a, for a little bit more clarification on exactly what well, you're trying to I can take, well, I can can just take, take that in two parts. So, so the, you're, you mentioned an Israeli example that seems to fall in the same basket as my example, right? Foreign countries trying to influence U.S. policy. In that case, you know, there was some criminal, uh, some police action to try to deter it. Um, uh, your other part of your question seemed to be about whether the U.S. government, you know, in the Cold War era, there were lots of examples of the U.S. government trying to covertly influence other governments. Um, some of them became scandals here, and I think those are less often done now, um, because we do have still, knock on wood, a free press um, and a fairly open political process so that when you know, if, if the CIA were to try to set up a bogus newspaper and spin bogus ideas in some foreign country for the idea of influencing its politics, chances are that would come out eventually. And the fact, there's an internal deterrent to doing too much of that. It makes the US and other open governments less inclined to do that and less good at it as much as they might try. Go ahead. Uh, this is a brief observation to maybe try to make a connection between the general point you're making and the Tunisian situation. I've heard from many people in the Gulf, uh, in the Emirates, in, in, uh, in Qatar, Saudi, that uh, when Yusuf al-Qaradawi dies, which he now has, uh, there's going to be a question of who's going to be the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood and the spiritual leader of, uh, uh, of the Muslim world. And uh, what I hear very frequently there, uh, it's going to be Hanushi. I don't particularly find that convincing, but I am reasonably convinced that a fair number of people think that's the case. Uh, so I wonder what you think of that, and does that help us to think about where Tunisia fits into this uh, connection of uh, the, what people, in the, what regimes in the Gulf are doing to, to influence the environment in which they live? 
Um, I think the arrest of um, uh, Shekinuchi is a tragedy because he, uh, of the importance of his ideas um, uh, far beyond Tunisia. I wish more people would be paying attention to events um, in Tunisia. Uh, I don't particularly want to participate in a conversation about who is going to be the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood or the Muslim world or political Islam. I just think that set of ideas is, that, that, that whole conversation is, is, is problematic. And again, we wouldn't have it about another religion. Like the thing about religions is they're, they're multiple and various and their meaning is always contested. And that's the good news. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think that Kar, you know, Kar Dawi was, he was a very effective broadcaster and a smart theologian, I guess, for the people who care about those things. But I don't think he was unique in the world and I don't think he's gonna be replaced. I mean, it's just, the nature of any religion, including my own, is it's a constant debate about its own meaning, and that's going to continue. The question is not to address, uh, I, I think that's a perfect example. The question is, do people in the Gulf who are out making policy, do they think that's the case? In the well, I think, I think if, you know, the Gulf states really, um, they don't like elections, and they don't like democracy, and they don't like the idea that political Islam could be a uh, could be associated with elections, um, and for that reason, I can only imagine that Sheikh Anushi was uniquely objectionable to many of the Gulf states. Last question, Dan. Yeah, um, this is way by way of an observation. I haven't read David's piece, and I'm getting on a plane from Tunis tonight and plan to make that my. my You've got a lot forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to certainly increase my my uh, sense of pessimism, I suppose, in many ways, but. Um, I, I'm in the throes of writing a, a piece uh, provisionally entitled uh, Rethinking Global Autocracy, which is sort of a deep dive into the literature here, coming particularly out of the think tank community, which attributes uh, processes of authoritarianism and autocratization chiefly to Russia and China. Um, and um, it's good to be reminded uh, of the multiple sort of vectors that are promoting autocracy globally, and that's part of the critique uh, that I'm writing uh, in, in response to the literature that's been put out by a lot of my colleagues. It's going to be interesting to see how this piece uh, evolves. But I do want to say that um, we have to, just two words of, kind of caution from my own sort of thinking about this. And it's been going on for months. I'm not finished, but I'm getting close to finish. And that is, number one, there's a complex relationship between the kinds of dynamics you're talking about, David, and the nature of any democracy, including the American democracy. I get concerned when we hear words like subversion and so on, but I think that the, the key drivers of our, of our democratic crisis are largely embedded in our own country. And these the foreign effects exacerbate them, but there is a kind of notion out there that, that, uh, that uh, the so-called uh, democratic malaise or backsliding is a consequence of international interventions and so on, particularly from the Russians and the Chinese. And I, we have to be really careful. It's a, it's a very complicated question analytically uh, and conceptually and empirically. And the other observation is that there's an obsession in Washington with Chinese influence. Um, the, you know, that's all you hear about now. It's the number one existential threat we hear in the Congress. And the consequences for our own Chinese American citizens has been quite negative. Um, because, there's, you know, it's not on the par with concern perhaps with Russian influence in the 50s, but there's a lot of kind of McCarthyism out there about sort of Chinese influence. And it's just, I just want to say, it's just very disturbing. Um, and it's uh, become an obsession here in, in Washington. And um, and while there is a lot of malign influence, that's the term almost always used, malign. First of all, the question of how it affects our democracy is complicated. But second of all, it's certainly overdrawn, I think, in so many ways, and, and really detracts from a lot of the other sort of influences uh, you know, we had four years of an American president who did more to model autocracy uh, than any American president in, in, in many years. So I just, I just sort of a cautionary tale about sort of where and what kind of causes we try to draw in terms of our own, our own democracy. Thanks. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I tried to say um, before, you know, our own democracy is, as I said, is self subverting, right? We have our own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we don't wanna, I don't want to oversell the idea that foreign governments are. are you know, men, I don't want to, I don't want to traffic in conspiracy theories. Um, they're not, uh, we can't attribute our own problems to and others. I very much appreciate it. Hidden hands. Yeah. And that's very, that's very important. Now in D.C. we have this kind of obsession that is part of the policies of the think community. And so I recognize you said that it has to be repeated. Yeah, 
I just want to end um, um, by emphasizing uh, a fact that everyone knows that the quality of any democracy is really dependent on a free press, but also investigative journalists who are willing to take risks to pursue stories that illuminate some of the sort of you know scandals and um, you know unethical practices that authoritarian regimes are are pursuing in this case in the Middle East. And if it wasn't for your sort of real you know commitment to pursuing investigative journalism, we wouldn't know about this. So thank you very much for the work that you've done in the past on the Arab Spring. Thank you for this recent article in the New Yorker. I think we are um, better as a country because of journalists of your caliber. So thanks again. Thank you.